Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Love and Law. My name is Virginia Warren. I'm a lawyer and conflict alchemist and co-founder of the organization called Lawyers for Love. At Lawyers for Love, we see that love uh, is a solution to all our problems and that the legal system tends to solve problems with fear-based solutions. It says that love thy neighbor and if you can't, we'll punish you. It acts like it's your parent. Lawyers for Love say to solve a problem, you need to move to a higher level of consciousness than what was used to create the conflict, that consciousness is based in love. Love says, love thy neighbour, and if you can't, we will show you how. It teaches you self-regulation. This is what we call a lovers of the essence consciousness, or Leo Tech for short. On these Love and Law Live broadcasts, we're showcasing amazing lawyers globally who are bringing their own style of love into legal practice. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Peter Gable. Peter is the former president of New College of California and was a law professor at New College's Public Interest Law School for over 30 years. He has been editor at large of Ticken Magazine for the last 30 years and is now co-chair of the Project for Integrating Spirituality, Law and Politics. He's also currently president of the Arlene Francis Foundation for Spirit, Art and Politics in Santa Rosa. He's the author of many articles on law, politics and social change and has published three books, The Bank Teller and Other Essays on the Politics of Meaning, Another Way of Seeing, Essays on Transforming Law, Politics and Culture, and most recently, The Desire for Mutual Recognition, Social Movements and the Dissolution of the False Self. This book was, this latest book was nominated by Routledge Press as Best Nonfiction Book of 2018. He received an honorary doctorate of laws from San Francisco State University in 2015 and has been described by Cornell West as one of the grand prophetic voices in our day and a long distance runner in the struggle for justice. It is my great pleasure to welcome you, Peter, to the show. My, I believe my, it's, it's, it's Halloween there. Uh, it's you're having Halloween. trick or treaters apparently come to the door. So if you've got to get up and go to give that treat. If I do <laughs> yes. have to, I'll, put, I'll have to put my hat on, but not my That's... robe. I've already figured this out. So <laughs> you've got to do that <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. Thank you for sharing that because I love yeah. it. I love it that we can be more of ourselves and we can really play in life and what, one thing I really love too is that a, a lot of lawyers want to separate their lives as lawyers from their regular life. I mean, mm -hmm. this is our whole life. So to have people yeah. on this show, especially to show me who they are, <laughs> this is great. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so uh, much. What I first ask our guests are is, is how did you first get into law? This is the interest that most people want to know. What was What was your inspiration? Oh, well, to be honest, I, I first got into law because my father told me I could had to either go to law school or business school. I was <laughs> a, and I was a, a compliant young person just out of college, and I got into Harvard Law School, and my father was extremely excited about that. He had a vision for me uh, on the Supreme Court, and... Um, I, I, I went, even though my interests at that time were almost, were mainly in literature, art, and of course it was 1968, 1969, so I was being swept up in the social movements of the 1960s. So in one part of me, there was a dawning awareness that a completely different kind of world was possible in which people could fully see one another, affirm one another, and create a world that was based on meaning, love, and care for each other and the world. That was one half of me. And the other half was doing what my father told me to do. So uh, that half went to law school. And it <laughs> took a long time before I got these two halves together because uh, the experience at that time of uh, Harvard Law School was as chilly as can be. Uh, it was almost all white males in 
suits and ties, um, still in suits and ties, the um, the 10 women who were in my section of, uh, I believe, 150 people were in my section. So I went to all my classes in contracts, property, torts, civil procedure, criminal law. In that section, there were 10 women. They they were all expected to wear dresses and they had to endure, um, they had to endure a very difficult kind of trial by gender to get through that experience. So, uh, so, so that's what, that's how I got into it is I, I was completely and utterly alienated from my experience. And I practically had a nervous breakdown because of the conflict inside myself. And then yet later, after I graduated, uh, I couldn't imagine practicing I became a law professor, thinking that would give me the space to say what I had to say. And then later I was able to use the suffering that I had endured and the contradiction inside myself to develop an approach to law that saw what was wrong with the, the side that, that was so painful to me and analyzed how it broke the world into pieces, how it shattered human community, uh, how it treated human beings as uh, at arm's length and completely separated from each other, rather than as coming towards one another and seeking each other's recognition and affirmation. This took a long time. I mean, because we had to, and we built a whole movement uh, that you are actually part of, uh, out of that experience of the the link between the creation of community law and the struggles for social justice in the world. So that's how it happened. It took it took a long time to achieve the reconciliation that that I was able to do eventually. Then I started writing writing about it frantically, trying to m- make it known that the the model of law that we were enveloped by and had been for a few hundred years, that this model of law treated the world as if we were all disconnected monads floating in space with no bonds to each other. When in reality, the truth is that we are united to each other by a spiritual bond a sense of oneness and a longing to see that in each other's eyes and in each other's essence in all of daily life. So the struggle then became, struggle still is, to build a movement in in the legal field that transforms this paradigm that we've inherited, the socially separated paradigm, and that builds a paradigm of interhuman community with law, law as a way of healing, restoring that interhuman community by healing the distortions that we have inherited that otherwise affect us. Yes, because suffering can be used as a catalyst, can't it, as you've just said, uh, and, and the legal system could be used for that. Yes, well, that's true. That's true. Uh, you mean the suffering in the legal system? Yeah, uh, yeah. you come to this. You come to the system with a suffering. You, right. you come with your problem on a plate and say, "Here, you fix it, lawyer, yeah, exactly. or make me win, or validate me." And, and no, that's not it. It's, it's give it back to the person. Say, "Oh, there's something in here for you. You could you could actually evolve from this." Well, actually, I've heard you speak on this and mm. think your way of doing that is is. Uh, very imaginative, imaginative and uh, <laughs> daring, actually, and yeah. probably uh, you could probably get a lot of resistance from people who want you to solve their problems. Um, yeah, yeah. The funny thing is, I think people don't. Uh, they, at a heart level, they understand, but then they don't know how. I, I, they want to feel better by punishing somebody else. Oh, yeah. I'm going to blame you because. Uh, if I don't blame you, then then who's responsible? I can't be responsible. Yeah. <laughs> it can't be me. And that's and that's what I I see. Well, so happening. that's the the structure. Sorry to interrupt, but that that yeah. is the structure of the legal system that we have inherited. That yeah. is, 
socially separated individuals, all pursuing their own separate interests, disconnected from all others, and a legal process in which the uh, which is adversarial and designed to aggrandize your own position and demonize the other's position. Uh, that's the whole way that you're taught law in law school, and you're taught to become a lawyer, and it's it's uh, kind of a characteristic personality disorder of lawyers, that their letters are written like that, their their behavior is reflective of that, and, and then the, the method for solving disputes is this purely analytical, verbally detached method, um, rights analysis, in which, in which the goal is to get everyone their rights, to vindicate your client's rights. The goal is not to heal whatever wound led to the breakdown in relationship in the first place, and create a new unity out of that process. So our goal, and I'm, I, I'll get into this in a second, the goal of the, of the movement I'm trying to help build with the project for integrating spirituality, law, and politics is, is that second goal, is to, is to, I mean, of course, you want to win your cases now. You want, you, you want, you want to, you want to conduct a law practice the way you have to do it in 2021, uh, which which is reflects the, the present paradigm to some extent, and therefore you have to work with that when you talk to the bailiffs or opposing attorneys or when you help the client figure out what he or she wants to achieve in a case and how you relate to the client. All of that is is this inherited surrounding environment. And I am also supportive of this, the great struggles for rights that women, people of color, the labor movement, all the great struggles that have led to the expansion of rights are, are good things. But they're much too limited in the framework is still the wrong framework. The true framework, which we are seeding, I would say now, and trying to give birth to is one in which the, in which the aspiration is to develop methods where we can more deeply connect with each other, as I said, and, and unearth whatever pain and distortion has kept us separate up to this point. So that's why, if I may keep talking for a minute, that's why yes. the project for integrating spirituality, law, and politics that's up there, I th hope it's on everyone's screen, um, if, it, if it's not, we'll put it up later in the in the chat box. Yes. So, so that that project emphasizes expanding the use of restorative justice, transformative mediation, creating new forms of practice that bring a spiritual dimension into practice. We can and we can talk about about that a bit. I hope, and then transforming the way law is taught because. You know, we keep producing new generations, a generation after generation of lawyers who arrive in law school. Most law students arrive thinking they're excited because they're going to have an encounter with what's just and what's true. And instead, by November of the first year, they're ground down into analyzing the details of the parole evidence rule or, uh, you know. Or, or other the other rules that first year students have to currently learn. And that grounding down process teaches you to be the old paradigm. It teaches, it doesn't tell you that. It just does it to you because the only way you can succeed is by producing that kind of, I would say, alienated persona. Argumentative, glassy eyed, cut off from your heart, cut off from your feelings, Making this argument and that argument, <laughs> all of it's fear-based. Yeah, it's it's a fear-based paradigm. And, and and what I like to say is it's an egregore. I call the legal system an egregore, a fear-based egregore, so that the, the the negative energy is so powerful that you are drawn into it. All all negative energies within you are drawn into it. This is one I wanted to just take you back to, like the hippie movement. Why was it? 
that, you know, we had free love. We had all these beautiful ideas back then. And then suddenly everyone cut their hair and got a day job. You know, I, it's, it's, I, I know. Yeah, I see. That. I see. You are the exception to that rule, but it's it's so funny um, that the system, the the system, the political system, and I think everything is underpinned by the legal system. And this is what I think most people have failed to see mm -hmm. that our planet Earth is underpinned by a negative based system. It is me versus you, me protecting myself against you because I don't trust you, you know, rather but you are me and I am you. So that we that egregore, that thought form is so very powerful that you can be in church and say, peace be with you, or be on your yoga mat and say, om, and then go out into the world and someone cuts you off in traffic and you want to tear their head off. So <laughs> it's because... It, you're, you're pulled into that negative energy so readily and it's it's there. So the, my view is too that we need to soften that energy and un, the understanding that or the compassion that comes with I am you and you are me yes. is 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 the softening that we need to, to settle the energies, to bring them closer to love because as it won't happen overnight but it's certainly something we could, we're all personally responsible for, I think. I do too. I do too. Mm. And the the thing that that happened to us, in fact, I, it's a my hair length here is is a uh, this happened. Of course, I faced this in the mid nineteen eighties when Ronald Reagan got elected the second time. That was the moment in nineteen eighty four when um, everyone headed for the hills, uh, went back to business school, put on arrow shirts. <laughs> and cut their and cut their hair, and you could yeah. see, yes, you could see the hair falling off practically <laughs> the whole the whole society, and and uh, it, because I, this people were afraid that what they had hoped might be happening wasn't happening. The fear of the other that you expressed gained dominance, and People just felt um, this was sort of a general panic in which everybody abandoned each other. And, you know, I say that uh, with compassion because there was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of pressure to do it. But this is the problem. This is what yeah. happened in movements is that they ebb away through an infinite set of small ways of not carrying forward and manifesting the love that you're speaking of, the higher consciousness that, that movements so often aspire to. And so as each person sort of flattens out, uh, each person cuts her or his hair, everyone is internalizing, maybe what I was hoping for can't really happen. Yeah. And then they cut their own hair. And then they, when they cut their own hair, by the way, it's fine if they you, cut the hair of everyone <laughs> except you. <laughs> this is this is about a particular moment, the moment. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then what happens is is you then become a part of it. If you if you adopt, to take your example of softening your discourse, your way of presenting yourself. If you think, well, in order to really make it as a lawyer, I have to be tough argumentative, hard, that's what everyone else is and I have to do it, then you become that and transmit that very thing to others. That very, so the fear that you internalized, you then externalize and somebody else will see you and think, oh, well, I guess what I, what I was hoping for can't really happen. So, yeah. yeah. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm all for lawyers for love that sort of don't hold back. <laughs> yeah, not, well, I love heels, and that's what yeah. I see anyway. And, and, and it, but it's it's one of as we were talking before. It's one of the hardest things for people to grasp is the idea of love, because people see it as a doing word rather than a beingness. Mm -hmm. uh, love is a beingness, and it, it, it is our work. It's it's the fun part. You told me just at the beginning here that you came through law school and you had this other idealist, you know, yourself was two fragments really, and then you had to reconcile those. And that is loving 
the self because we've got to reintegrate self first before anything can happen. So it really is about our own reactions to life and why don't I like this and why am I doing it like they want me to do? And that is what I see as being love, doing things without fear, but it's a beingness. It's a, it's a Love is too hard to describe as a doing word because everyone has a different perception of that. Mm-hmm. So a beingness is a state of being without fear. And it's momentary, of course, because all we mm-hmm. have is now. Right. And we have a legacy of fear. Yeah. So it's not happening in a, in a completely neutral climate. Uh, it's happening in a climate where fear has already persisted for thousands of years. Yeah. So yeah. the thing is, though, I think, that everyone wants what you're just what you're describing. Everyone wants to be able to reveal their true being as love, as longing for love and as giving love. Everyone wants that, but because it's denied all around them, they deny it in themselves also. And therefore to make it in the society, you have to adopt this, what I call this false self that is masking the underlying true longing to be seen fully, to be fully present with the other, to as love, as the love that we are. That's why my my last book is, it's called The Desire for Mutual Recognition social movements and the dissolution of the false self dissolve dissolve that fear-based self so that you can actually reveal who you are and that involves yes it does involve taking a risk that it won't be reciprocated and that that takes that takes a movement like what you i think you and i together are trying to create to give people confidence that we are out here that you're not alone yeah, that's it. We're, 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 it is a desire for, as you just said before, I believe everybody is is motivated by love. They don't realise that. every Everything you do, everything even that's uh, perceived as unwanted is still a desire to be loved. You are looking for relief. You are looking to yeah move yourself toward that state of being. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it, it is it's definitely... Um, so many more lawyers now are coming and saying, yeah, the dissatisfaction in the system, because I I believe, yeah, there is a movement where people are saying, I want more connection, I want more out of my life, because you can only sustain, and I really call this physics too, the laws of thermodynamics apply Mm -hmm. here, particularly the second law of thermodynamics, which says that in closed systems, things uh, blow apart, is chaos, Mm -hmm. because and I see law as a closed system. It draws energy from the base upward, uh, whereas love is it's fear-based. So love is an open system where it flows. Yeah, it might look chaotic, but it goes exactly where it needs to, go with the flow. Uh, there's real power in those words, go with the flow. Yes, and, and people know it. People know it inherently. But as you said the same before, they're protecting the false self. That identity kept them safe as children. They bring it with them into okay. adulthood and mm-hmm. say, and say, oh, I, I can't change that because that were the tribe's rules and that's what I follow because I know that to be true. Mm-hmm. And, of course, everyone's truth is true for them and that's where the legal system also falls down. It doesn't recognise everyone's truth. Mm-hmm. Everyone's truth is true mm-hmm. because they, they're the rules you operate under. So mm-hmm. if we have compassion for somebody when we say, oh, yeah, yeah, you like green and I like red. But no, I don't like red. Red's terrible. Well, why is it? That's my truth. Green is mm-hmm. green is great and red is great too. So and let's have compassion. Yeah, I might prefer red, but you know, let's let's have compassion for each other. And I think that is if we can just even show people that, that's the beginning of the softening mm-hmm. of, of compassion. Just say, I see your point of view. It is valid for you, not for me, but for you. And that just releases us both from the negative energy. Yes. You know, um, if I may just refer to one point I make in the book, uh, a, a small point, in, in, a, in a philosophical chapter about how we communicate with each other, I draw a distinction between 
making an appeal and making an assertion. And I, the, the idea in the book is this book is an appeal to you, reader, listener. It's an appeal. I am not telling you you have to, that this is right and you have to agree with it. I'm saying I really do think this. I am really trying to illuminate the world as I see it. And I'm, the, the method is, the method is, it's an appeal to you to say, I agree with you, or, yeah. well, I agree with you about that, but not that, or. I see it, or I see it. I see what you're saying. I might, I might prefer it, but I see it. Yeah, yeah. And, they, and they might have modify it, and that's good. That's how, yeah. that's how the, the, the thinking, the theory, this way of seeing develops wisdom through yeah. that, precisely that kind of conversation. Yes, absolutely, because good good and bad um, are judgments. And, of course, our legal system, I've said before, is just a projection of our personal internal legal systems. Mm -hmm. Judgments um, are fear, that you've got to draw a line in the sand somewhere, and my judgment is different to yours, so who's getting yeah. this right? I don't know. So, yeah, good or bad is a judgment call at all time, and everything, in fact, is absolutely neutral you put the the value on it uh -huh. <laughs> and so that's where i find that the system just cannot work and i and what i think is so funny though and i you know love all lawyers dearly um, but but that yeah we have been programmed mm -hmm. we don't for such intelligent minds we are, are not even questioning the system we're working within why is there great dissatisfaction why are our clients dissatisfied why you know, why are why our are judges dissatisfied college? yeah why no one is really pulling it apart to have a look. They say they yeah. acknowledge that it's happening, but it's too because it, identities have been built around it. Right. And if and we are going to pull that apart, who are we? That's right. And then, and the sense of worth that the system has produced is so attached to your being like that that it's very difficult to listen to the voice within yourself that knows that it's wrong that knows that it's a cover, uh, uh, yeah. a, shield, a shield for your real being, for the being yeah. that you actually are. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I know it's it's such a and it's such a big deep topic as well. I could go, I could personally go on and on, and I know that you've written lo lots and lots about these kinds of things, which is is, is marvelous. And um, in the in the description, yeah, you'll see all Peter's books there. So go and have a look because these we're all talking about Can this sort of movement. Yes, please. The, yeah, the that's the latest one. Recognition. Uh, yeah. Social, and that says social movements and the dissolution of the false self. False self. Published yeah. by Rutledge Press. And actually, if I may say, in the chat line, I put up my website, which has all of my, both my books and articles, but it also has my blog, which applies these ideas to many current events. And so um, it's petergableauthor.com. And in when I was talking earlier about the about Pi Slap, the project for integrating spirituality, law, and politics, where we're trying to advance this movement in the US. And also we have quite a big European group now, and I hope an Australian group soon to follow. You, Virginia, soon to follow you. <laughs> Uh, that's the, that's the website that's up there, spiritlawpolitics.org. And the last thing I'd say is just please join. Join us. It costs so little to join, and it adds so much strength to us. In just the way that you've been saying, one purpose of your work and this show is to let other people know they're not alone. They're part of a, a, a group of people who are who are emerging and being a member joining pie slap for the small amount that it is helps us to do that too yeah and look the 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 beautiful thing about love is and when we're all getting together with that energy it is so powerful mm -hmm. it is so powerful so if we're, you, we're all joining together in love it is such a powerful movement even if the numbers aren't as many as the rest of the profession yeah. It really is. Every time someone raises their consciousness, they raise it for all of us. And that is absolutely what I've, I I love hearing that because every time someone, you know, 
dissolves the false identity. Mm -hmm. They raise themselves up and and it, it does it for me too. I, I'm so thrilled because thank you for everyone for doing that for me. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's lovely because I, yeah, the way I said, I am you and you are me and we're all mm -hmm. having these experiences and it's when we're rejecting someone else's experience, when we're judging them as bad, we're judging a part of ourselves as being bad because mm -hmm. we are all that is, we are the one collective. And mm -hmm. for me, I, I don't see how that, uh, I, I love to hear your experience. Mm -hmm. That connects me to you. It's like, wow, mm -hmm. did that really happen? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, rather than, oh, that's terrible. I don't, I don't go for that. I don't like that <laughs> kind of person. That's, that's no, 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 no. Right. For me, it's, we are all that is. Yeah, some yeah. behaviour, as I say, is not preferred. So let's show people with love. And I just want to say one last thing on that is why I think it hasn't happened is because people do not know how to love. They're afraid of it, and I believe our human journey is to find love. Mm -hmm. So, of course, that's the challenge. <laughs> We're here to play that game, mm -hmm. and let's keep it fun. Well, Peter, yeah, our time is almost up, so I would like it if you could possibly give a tip to any lawyers. You're a law professor. Uh, what are you teaching lawyers, or what are you saying to lawyers about bringing a little bit more love into the legal profession? Well, I think I'll talk, just say a word about um, a place called the Georgia Justice Project in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, if you go to spiritlawpolitics.org and you look at the intensives that we had two weeks ago, the pie slap intensives, we had five pre, uh, two hour presentations on Zoom uh, that embody our work. And one of them was the was bringing a spiritual dimension into law practice, and um, I'll just say briefly the, the it is a just it's just a wonderful place where people at the Georgia Justice Project uh, they they serve meals to all their clients twice a year. If you become a client there, you become a part of the law firm community. Um, we discussed one case. Uh, that one of their lawyers did in which, um, you know, that's a big thing that they take your driver's license away if you don't make your child support payments in, in Georgia. And that's that's a disaster because then you can't drive and then you can't get a job. See and, then, a job. and you want to you want to love your children and show you love them, but you can't you're stuck in the legal system puts you in this uh uh catch twenty two. Okay, so just what, what what Ross Brockway described was that, that he helped this. Yes, he helped this guy get his driver's license back, but he also, and the law firm does this, found to help find him a job so that he he could m begin to make money. And mm -hmm. they got him the license, they got him the job, and then he, most importantly, became part of the community of the law firm. So he would drop by there. Uh, this is somebody who was totally isolated and demeaned as somebody who, who wasn't uh, supporting his kids and wasn't supporting his family. Through the, the way the firm embraced him, he gained confidence that he could uh, reconnect with his past partner, with his kids. He had a driver's license. So the legal issue and the psycho-spiritual issues were linked in the whole way they think at the Georgia Justice Project. So that's my example. That's so beautiful. Oh, wow. That's really beautiful. Uh, that They showed him some love so they, he could see that there is love in the world and yes. he could find it within him. Uh, that's just amazing. I so love if you that. Go to that. If you go to that site, just look up the intensive bringing a spiritual dimension to law, pra to, to law practice, and that intensive describes this kind of work that that's we will put all that in the um under the chat uh today when we post these again so you'll okay. see all these websites for peter and i just want to thank you so much peter for being part of this today because it it really does uh help other lawyers that are wanting wanting to be in this space come forward and say you're not alone come and join in we're moving in a different direction it's an alternate platform you're not going to fix the existing one 
we're moving somewhere else. So if you're a lawyer who brings love into law in your own unique way, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can connect with us at the email address or on our website listed below. So thank you so much, Peter. It's so wonderful to speak to you. Happy Halloween. Thank you. And thank you we so will much. speak again soon. I hope so, Virginia. Yay. <laughs> no.